Cherry Hill has the best set of greens in Canada. Period. Pretty bold. Yeah. In the early 1900s, an architect by the name of Walter Travis hopped the border and stamped his unique design style on Canadian soil, first at Lookout Point and second at Cherry Hill. They may be close on a map, but these two clubs boast their own brilliant distinctions and have become two of the top courses in the country. This is the Walter Weekend. In 1922 was founded by uh, nine uh, founders, Buffalonian uh, members, um, vacationed on the north shore of Lake Erie and decided at that point there was no bridge, so they had to ferry back and forth. So uh, they're like, let's commission someone to build something over on the Canadian side. The thing that stands out to me about Travis is his greens. His, his uh, contouring and his greens are just much more aggressive and um, imaginative as well than any other architect. So I would say he's one of the best two or three in history of golf. Walker was adamant about getting the American side of the story too, hence why you two clowns yeah. didn't see it. Right. <laughs> did he, did he say we were That's why you're wearing a pink cherry yellow shirt. Right? Exactly. exactly. For the record, there's a hockey stick in the... <laughs> When we started the, we have a friendly can am every year, Bains vs. Americans. Uh, seven or eight and one, I think we are. Just for uh, I think we're eight. Not that I'm bragging, but um, yeah. that that is, that hockey stick goes through the biggest bagger of on the American team. You know, we traditionally majority of our members were American, and now it's closer to 50 percent. And I think that's going to be our future for sure. And I think um, maintaining that history of of that will really bode well, and that's where I hope the, the club is in, in 30 years. Talk to us a little bit about uh, your decision to come to Cherry Hill. Retirement, uh, Lisa and I were getting close to retirement, started looking around for a place outside of the GTA. We wanted something a little quieter, small town. Um, we have friends who are members here. They invited us over, we played, I played four holes and said this is it for me. So we basically would have joined if we could that day, but got all the membership papers and did, did what we needed to do then and then started looking for a house. Not too late. No, no, no. We made up some time. I thought it was going to be half an hour late. <laughs> oh, no. We were a little stressed. Oh, geez. How you doing? Good, good. Good morning. Walter weekend, baby. Turn left onto Cherry Hill Boulevard North. Oh. What is it? Cherry Hill Boulevard. No, I don't know. I'm just getting excited. I totally missed the sign. The first time I pulled up to Cherry Hill, the, the thing that struck me the most was just the, the history that oozed off the clubhouse. You could feel um, its prominence sitting uh, much higher than anything else in the whole entire area and the fact that the clubhouse sort of stood out. And then you realize that everything kind of radiated out from that clubhouse. A fear of being vulnerable. When I played here for the first time after the border closing, it was like emotional turning on to Cherry Hill Boulevard. Yeah. You know, you've been gone for, we've been gone for two years almost. Yeah, like 18, um, 19 months. Yeah. So I think there's some of that feeling still left. But what I think of Cherry Hill, I think it's 18 really good holes. I don't think there's a throwaway hole. I think it's, it, you need to hit you know, shots for consistently well for 18 holes. That's, that's how I always view it. So Pierre hosted so many fantastic and national championships. Uh, so 72 Open, is that right? Yeah, Canadian Open in 1972. CPGA was 82. Okay, 1982. More recently, you've had uh, PJ Tour Canada, Kenzie Tour up here. Yeah, that was a special year. Um, the forest fires out in Fort McMurray, and so they, you know, had to act quickly to find a new venue, and it 
the membership and board of directors were fantastic and we had about five months to put it together and in a world-class field. Um, lots of players are now playing on the, uh, the big tour. Players like Dave Bunker would join Cherry Hill because it's um, a really good test of golf. So it's gonna always, every day, no matter what's going on, no matter which way the wind blows, he's gonna have to sort of really work for a score. Got a first tee start on Thursday and at St. George's and lots of friends, lots of family there. And when they announced my name, it was just like a great, great kind of roar and applause. And it was, it was really, really special. That, that opportunity to play two uh, PGA Tour events, but also two Canadian Opens National Championships, really, really awesome. There's spots to take the golf course like the six, and there's spots to admit that the golf course is better than you are, like the 11th. As many, many people will know, to keep them at that speed is quite difficult at times, and it, it, it might not be the healthiest approach to making sure the greens are in good shape. Um, it just works here. You know, the creativity that it, it allows uh, you to see when you're on the property uh, at that speed, it's just, it's just a blast. In simplicity, it's just proof that a great set of greens can take a very average piece of land and make it a special golf course. And then what comes after that is the bunkering. The bunkering, um, it's unusual. It, it, it uses forms that are above the ground. So it relies more on, rather than sand flashes, it relies more on mounding and, and the forms around it. So if I found myself uh, actually playing in a Canadian Open, I think I would look to try to score on the first, hit it as close as possible and try to get up and down. I think that's your best opportunity early. Number one, you just don't want to be long. Uh, it, it's a very straightforward hole. Uh, you're wise to actually play it conservatively because it should be a par. Even for a mid-handicap, it should be a par. It's, it's one of the few times the golf course is actually offering you uh, easy opportunity. One. One is a good green where it's very, very deceptive and it's right off the right off the bat. On the second, the, the biggest thing is you really want to find fairway. It's almost worth not being long. Um, reason being is because everything's kind of crowned and running away from you, it just gets to bad places too easily. Um, through is not awful there. It's one of the few spots where you don't have any regrets for being through. But it's not an obvious miss, but the play is short and bounce it in. If you do that, you actually take out most of the risk. So the thing about three that makes three really uh, a challenge to play is it's really sheeting heavily uh, on the fairway to the left. It's actually falling into the tree, so it's very hard to find that, that fairway, yet you need to be down the left-hand side, which is really hard to do. Four is a good green side because you're hitting such a long iron in that you really have to place where your approach is, otherwise you can really end up in some trouble on four. So the hole everybody who's a member there fears the most is five because it's so easy to hit a light cut and the other thing is it, particularly if the wind turns, the wind happens to be not coming directly off the lake, um, you have everything just sort of leaks into, it, it leaks towards the water. And then the worst part is it looks like the miss is the chipping areas on the left, and that is not the miss. That is the worst miss of all. Well, six is a reprieve. So, admittedly, we did actually try to add a little bit more teeth to it. Um, but it is, it is a reprieve to the round. You've got a short five. Um, it's not very strongly defended, particularly after the last few holes you've played. The green's actually, other than it's got a tear in it, the tear actually makes it more receptive anyway. Um, 
it, it's clear opportunity. So you get to that point in the round, you're clear opportunity, and the interesting thing is, while well, you turn into the win on seven, it's clear opportunity again. That's your spot. You have to score there because you're not going to get another chance to score till 12. Eight, nine, 10, and 11 is really, you know, that's the meat of the course, right? Those are four challenging holes. Um, and for me, you know, from the tee shot on eight until, you know, the, the balls of the hole on 11, I'm pretty stressed out. Thinking here. I well, I'm just gonna kind of take it right over the left edge of the bunker. I think. Okay. The first bunker, or the second bunker is, I think. Where my where my mind is at is how far is the left edge of the water? Because it's definitely in play with this left right wind. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a safe play. It's rough. Should be really good, yeah. Hopefully we can. Good sign, eh? Yeah, just an electrical box. <laughs> electrical boxes are never the great one. I got a buck fifty-four. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna play like a one forty-five shot. I think maybe maybe a little less. Okay. Yeah, But missing right or missing long is just such a disaster. Whereas I think front left bunker is acceptable. Even though there's that wall, it's... Even though there's a wall, it's the one place you can actually get to spots on the green from. I think once you make the turn, you've got to be We've talked about the greens a lot, but you've actually got to be more afraid of the greens on the back nine than the front, which sounds crazy after we've talked about greens, greens, greens. Um, 10 runs away from play. Uh, I haven't found anybody who seems to play that comfortably. Everybody always seems to be off. And then 11 with the, the top hat, the, the plateau on the left that nobody can hit a ball onto. I've yet to meet any player who can actually do it. I found it interesting that in the Canadian Open, a lot of players actually didn't play for the 11th green. They would play for just short and then try to get up and down. And they felt that essentially over four days, a 12 would beat the field. Look at 13, right? Yeah. Um, short par four, it's sort of in front of you, and it's a challenging hole. I mean, I, I think if you looked at the average scores, I would, I would venture to guess it's above par for most, you know, most players. And while it's short, you think, okay, this is a great opportunity, but it's amazing how often you end up either over the back or out the sides, because it, it's kind of like a, a Pinehurst-ish type of green where you're kind of hitting into a tortoiseshell and it doesn't look like it from far away because the bunkers kind of hide the features. And it's a wedge every time, and I don't think I've got a par on the card for the last three or four times I've played it. I like my chances better on 14 and 17 to make par than I do on 13. Fifteen is the hardest green to deal with in the golf course, I think. 
18 is another nasty green. 17 is a ridiculously hard green to hit. So what have you got left? 16 and 16 is broken into compartments. You really have to play. You just got to flat out play on the back nine. I love 15. We talked about that during the round. The 15 is my favorite hole just because the, the tee shot is challenging. You can play it a bunch of different ways. The green side is very challenging, particularly in the wind. Most days, by the time you get to 15, the wind's picked up and you're hitting a, you know, could be a seven iron or an eight iron into a good wind. And if you miss that green, you're in big time trouble. Sixteenth to me is the most Walter Travis hole there. So that is an absolute gem, perfect example of his architecture. And even restoratively, I didn't have to do anything. So I, I, essentially it was just stripping a few things out and, and, and getting things where they're supposed to be. But the, the plateau with the bunker across the front is something he did a lot. And it's just a really good example of taking Probably not the most interesting site, but by creating that plateau, uh, that to me, that's the par three that really stands out. If you can't shape the shot from left to right, then you can't take advantage of at least shortening it down and making it a little bit more manageable. So if you've pulled it off in the left rough, you're already pretty much toast. Um, the other thing that's really difficult about it is the the pinning area is almost a false front the whole way, followed by a false back. And it's the false back that gets you into trouble. If you get too close to it, if you get too deep, you're done. Trying to shorten the hole and ending up left rough pretty much takes away all the good stuff. Whereas blowing it way right is actually not that bad because you get all the grades are now feeding and working with you. It actually is much higher than you'd think going up there. It uh, rises almost 20 feet. It takes such a long time to, to get to that elevation that you don't notice that you're, you're actually climbing pretty good at the end. The, so the green sits up in a high point. It's also got a really expansive chipping area on the back and it's probably one of the more highly contoured chipping areas. Credit goes to John Gall, who's the super there up until just recently. I would get these phone calls out of the blue and he would say, wouldn't the left of uh, 14 green be great if we just cut that all short? Yes, it would. And that's how a lot of the expansions went on. So Jeremy will continue with that too. He's on the same mindset. That's the new superintendent. And the reason you push the short grass areas are for the options for play but it also identifies the contours of the greens much more effectively. The more short grass you have around greens, the more greens stand out. If you want a really obvious example, it's Augusta National. The reason the greens look so spectacular is because of all, everything else is um, short around it. To me, one of the perfect days of golf there is available in Canada. Probably one of my favorite 36s that can be done is to play Cherry Hill and Lookout Point on the same day. And one of the joys of doing that is Cherry Hill, everything's on the micro. It's all about how the ball runs. It's all about how, the, the, how much of an influence those greens have. It's all about the, the slopes and how everything's running and you've got to be really in tune with where the land is going to take the ball away when it's not obvious. At Lookout Point, Everything's on the, the grand, the, the macro. And there are so many great choices made by Travis with his routing, with his green sites and everything else. Travis was able to, given two completely different sites, take two completely different approaches successfully. And that's what makes Tra uh, Walter Travis special. Fresh shirt. Listen, fresh I shirt. Blue shirt. Double, double button. Yeah. Is it a cocktail? 
Uh, <laughs> uh, I would challenge you guys to find the skinny side. Good angle. My time on the board, I think the important thing is we're not going to change as a club. We want to make it a better Cherry Hill, right, from what it has been. And um, we've done that with a recent course renovation. We've done that with some clubhouse enhancements. And, and I think the mantra should be to continue to do that. That's two. That's two and eight holes. <laughs>